There is a battle that is being waged, and it's for you. That's not so much outside of you. I mean, the, the battle ultimately was won on the cross in Christ. The resurrection validated a victory once and for all that God is for us and not against Go. So he gives us authority, which means that the victory of Christ becomes our victory. We get to celebrate the reality of that victory every single day. And still, though, there is a darkness to contend with. That darkness is vying for your attention and your affection. And so if there's any battle that's left to fight spiritually, it's ultimately going to be something that's not external outside of you, though it may feel like it's coming from outside of you. No, it's actually inside of you. Every single day, you and I have a choice to surrender our heart, our mind, and our voice to the things of God. To be used by God to be a living invitation to this world of His grace, of His power, of the saving victory of the cross, of the power of the resurrection, of the power of, of Christ to deliver us from a spirit of fear, of bondage, of torment, sin, sickness, disease, all of the works of darkness that come against us every single day. We live to enforce the victory of the cross so that there is no no doubt in our mind that Christ has won. And you, each and every one of us. And what the Bible tells us we can do to actually stand in victory, in faith, no matter what's going on around us, that we actually can stay victorious on the inside. The condition of your heart on the inside will have an impact on the world outside and around you. And so today, we're going to talk about three battlegrounds inside of us all. Welcome to the broadcast of Faith Mountain Ministries. My name is Bill Vanderbush. I'm glad you're here. In case you've wondered where the music from this broadcast comes from, it's from a friend of mine named Michael Gaffone. It's from the album Voyage. The song's called Uplift. And the entire album is just an instrumental masterpiece of cinematic uh, music that's really birthed from a person who has an incredible value for the heart of God. So if you're looking for some cinematic uh, background music, instrumental music, great driving music, check out Michael Gaffone on iTunes, on Spotify, and uh, check out his music. It's really, really incredible, and I'm really grateful to Michael for letting me use it for the broadcast here. Well, today on this podcast, I'd like to draw your attention to an external force to have an influence on. And every single day, many times a day, external forces and voices are constantly vying for the attention of these three areas. The first one my dad talked about a lot, and it's your mind. And my dad used to have a lot of messages on how to control your own mind. In other words, how to master your thought life. And I was always surprised as to how popular those particular messages were. Growing up in, in our home, we were constantly uh, surrounded by uh, conversations about the Word of God, conversations about the presence of the Lord, testimonies about miracles. And so it felt like that that's kind of what we, what we talked about all the time and what we spoke about is really what we thought about. And I always found myself growing up with an, with an incredibly encouraged culture and environment and atmosphere around me. You know, I find these days that the noise coming from all around us is oftentimes overwhelming to the mind. And it's a wonder why uh, attention deficit disorder has become such a huge thing. It's because there's so many things. If you're standing in a crowd and people are constantly yelling for your attention and you don't know who to give your attention to and you're trying to get to all of them, you, f you feel like uh, you're overwhelmed. And that's kind of what it can feel like, I think, in the world today. You know, one of the times my, my dad used to talk about simpler times, and I'd say, Dad, what made, what made the times you know, so much simpler? And he never, wasn't talking nostalgic or sentiment. He would always say things like, you know, the, the best thing about the good old days is that they're gone. And I think he was, you know, talking about a, a lot of the hardships of the old days. But he would talk about a simpler time when things that were vying for your attention weren't so, weren't so loud, weren't so overwhelming. 
It seems like everywhere you go in the media is millions, billions of, of options for us in, in our eyes, in our ears, can originate within just you. I mean, that's one of the sources. God actually created you and I to produce uh, a thought that's completely independent of any external influence. That's your thought. But thoughts can also come from heaven, from God. I believe God can actually speak into our thought life. The mind surrendered to think the thoughts of God is a mind that's stayed on him. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. So I believe God actually speaks directly to the mind that surrendered to hear his voice and, and to comprehend his presence. But the third source would be darkness. The forces of darkness, I think, can speak to us. And we give our minds over to darkness. We are turning up the volume on the voice of a, of a source that does not have your best interest in heart. Uh, the influence of darkness in our life will have consequences even for the believer. Now, some people may say, well, how in the world can darkness, how can the devil actually even speak into our mind? Well, he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. So what it means when the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, James 4, 7, when the scriptures speak of Satan or the devil, I think they're referring to the overall influence of darkness rather than just the individual devil himself. Because the devil couldn't be in millions of places at the same time, tempting people and putting thoughts or suggestions in their minds. There are fallen angels. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how many there are, but there are fallen angels out there. There are demonic forces out there. And they're still carrying out the work of darkness. And I would say most of us probably aren't going to ever run into the devil himself personally, but the spirit of darkness, the spirit, the satanic mindset that is bombarding the world through demonic force is influence of darkness. Resist even spirit beings or demonic forces belonging to the kingdom of darkness. So I'm going to refer just in a general sense to the devil as darkness. Everything that has to do with anything that's fallen, anything that's out for your death, loss, or destruction will come under that same heading, right? Now, I don't think that the devil can read your mind. I don't think demons can read your mind. I think only God has the power to do that. Psalm chapter 7 and verse 9 says, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous, for the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright heart. I think ultimately, you know, it's God that has impact and influence internally on the mind. But externally, there can be forces of influence from all kinds of places that try to vie for our attention. But I think only God can actually speak to us internally in our thought life. Remember when Peter argued with Jesus, when Jesus was revealing what was about to happen with the death, burial, and resurrection. And Peter didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And he came against him, actually, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23. Jesus responds to Peter and says this phrase, Get behind me, Satan. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that Peter had suddenly become demon-possessed. He was saying that Peter is speaking out of a thought process where darkness or a satanic mindset has just gained influence. He goes on to say that you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. So we can actually be purposeful in what we fill our mind with, either the thoughts of God or the thoughts of man. And you'd say, well, that means I've got to really watch what I, what I look at and what I see. Well, that's true, but you've also got to watch how you see. A person who carries confidence in their authority, in, in, the, in the things of God, and knows that they live to actually be a light in this world, can step into a very dark environment and not be influenced by that darkness, but actually seek to influence or to bring the light of the world into that place. 
However, I think many of us find ourselves in a place of maybe uh, mental fatigue and weakness. And, and then when you open your eyes and your ears to external influences that maybe don't reflect the things of God, but reflect a, a kingdom that is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, can find ourselves being crushed under the weight of that influence. That means we've got to keep our conscious awareness of the spirit and the presence of God on high at all times. It's a big deal for us uh, as, as believers, I think, to always remember that Jesus said, you are the light of the world. In that phrase, he empowered and equipped you to step into uh, places where it may seem very dark, but you're there to change the atmosphere, not to come into agreement or partnership with it. We change the atmosphere by speaking the truth in love, by declaring what the Lord is saying, by being a living invitation to be able to invite people to come into a saving relationship with Paul's recognizing that there's a thought that's actually in my head right now that I'm entertaining that's not from God or not righteous, and it doesn't agree with the truth of heaven. Not every evil thought comes from the devil. Sometimes it just originates with us the desires of our our own flesh. But I would say this, the devil can exploit those thoughts and can add to them. When we entertain thoughts that aren't godly, then we're essentially turning the dial of our attention to be able to, to tune into something that isn't from heaven and be influenced by it. Let me give you an all too common example. If you find that your thoughts are filled or overflowing with negative or critical thoughts or unloving thoughts, find yourself being discouraged by what other people are doing. But when you actually start thinking unloving thoughts toward them, wishing maybe for their demise or for their destruction in some way, thinking that, you know, if they could just if they could just feel some some sort of wrath, you know, it's almost like we start thinking the wrath of God upon other people people when we find ourselves being angry with them and feeling justified toward that. Maybe they're a different political party than we are. Maybe they have completely different values and we think that they need to feel the heat just a little bit. Maybe you actually find yourself being critical of other Christians or either other ministers or ministries. This one's all too common. And especially even among ministers, we find ourselves being incredibly critical of one another. You know, Jesus talked about this when he told the disciples, hey, look, if if they're not against us, they're with us. However the gospel is preached, just let the word of God go forth. And and you say, well, but they're misrepresenting. They're not representing it well. Now, that may be the case. None of us represent the kingdom of God fully with all of the glory that it actually deserves. Each one of us, I think, in a sense, sees through a glass dimly. And we can find ourselves coming into revelation that maybe we feel like with it and maybe take it places where we didn't have time to go. If the devil can get us to discredit people and destroy relationships, it would be a delight to the kingdom of darkness. To bring accusations, even within our own families, against husbands, wives, leaders, friends, or, or people from maybe another country or culture or city, or even against God himself. We find ourselves being angry with what's going on in the world and thinking that the the body of Christ is messing up. We can find ourselves criticizing the bride that Christ died for. You know, the Bible calls the devil the father of lies. And John created everything. Everything from this universe came from nothing. Nothing was brought to this creation until it was imagined in the mind of imaginations. Look around at the world that we live in, and and you see what man has been able to create with just the resources that we have here in the world. I think of what Elon Musk is doing. I think of what Steve Jobs created. and I I think of all those things you say, you know, Bill Gates and and whatnot. People say, oh, no, these guys are like the Antichrist or anti-Christian. Listen, I grew up in a time where we thought Jesus was coming back any minute. So a lot of people from my my generation didn't even go to college, never pursued education because in a sense we were told it was a waste of time. What's the point in pursuing all of that? Because you're not, you're not going to actually use it anyway because it's all going to burn. And now here we stand in 2020 and, and I, I realize, my goodness, now I'm pursuing going after the education I should have gotten back then 
in a sense, because I feel like it's it's incumbent upon us to not abdicate our creative responsibility to bring the thoughts of God into this world. When we abdicate that responsibility, we give it over to people who have no interest in the things of God, and yet, Look at that, in a sense, disconnected from a conscious awareness of the influence of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Look at what these people have been able to create. I think the next generation of create creative individuals must come from the body of Christ and create to the glory of God. And I think when that's the case, we're going to see creativity go to a completely different level. We'll go well beyond just little computers that you can hold in your hand and, and call all around the world or satellites just flying around the planet. I think we're going to go into quantum science levels that require a knowledge of God to be able to understand what modern science can't even begin to explain. May God give us just a renewing of the mind that impacts culture in that way. So the amazing ability that our mind has to be a a target or a tool of both the kingdom of God and the powers of darkness is significant. Even though maybe those things rarely ever happen, spiritually many of us are afraid of the dark. Not a literal fear of darkness. The fear of the dark comes when our sight is hindered and the imagination starts to picture terrible things that actually do not have any basis in reality. And so when we give darkness access to our thought life, I think he's just fine with supplying whatever images he can to bring us into partnership with fear, to pervert our creativity, and ultimately to abuse our imagination. And God, I believe, never intended for our imaginations to be abused through anything that was not holy or evil. He gave us imagination, I believe, for the purpose of dreaming with him, for the purpose of of giving faith a place to move. See, faith is imagining what God has spoken as though it were already complete or done. When we see it done in our mind, we have now planted a seed of faith in our own heart, in the soil of our own heart. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. David Hogan likes to say, now faith, and put those words together. Faith is now, now faith is famous portion of scripture that's been lifted, grabbed a hold of, chewed upon, and spoken out by many, many ministers. And I love that. The idea that faith is now. It's it's taking that which is in the future, appointed to the future, and bringing the promises of God into the present right now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, we read, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, strongholds can be a lot of different things. I've I've heard in my lifetime anything having to do with darkness or anything uh, like humanism, anything that's a different belief system other than Christianity, uh, governmental system like socialism and communism, other religions, other institutions. But in 2 Corinthians, strongholds doesn't necessarily refer to these massive complex systems uh, uh, that are humanistic in origin. It refers specifically to the stronghold of the mind. You know how powerful your mind actually is? These strongholds, these things are are like fortified castles uh, built up in your mind, brick by brick, stone by stone, through daily uh, a diet of wrong thinking, unbelief, fear-based, negative mindsets. Now, there are two strongholds of the mind that I would say are common among both Christians and non-Christians alike, and these are thoughts of condemnation, guilt, or shame, and thoughts of inferiority, like I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I, I, I'm, I'm worthless, those kind of things. 
So thoughts of inferiority and condemnation will actually keep you in a place of defeat consistently. The idea that you're not pleasing to God, you're not spiritual enough, you don't read your Bible enough, you're not close enough to God. Thoughts like that can actually make you feel like you can never break through out of the fog into the sunshine of the love, of the grace, of the goodness of God. And so then many people live their lives in condemnation. Listen, these are strongholds we got to cast down. David said in Psalm 139, the precious thoughts of God towards you outnumber the sand. And that's a lot of precious thoughts. Agreeing with what God thinks about you is one of the biggest challenges in our life. Let me jump to the second battleground. I've spent a lot of time on the mind, but the second battleground is the heart. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, watch speaks of protecting uh, our, ourselves, important parts of our body with the armor of God. And he's speaking spiritually here. And the heart and the head are the most vital and vulnerable. An arm or a leg, you can lose that in a battle. A wound to your, to your feet or to your hands can debilitate you, but a wound to the head and the heart will bring certain death. And in a spiritual sense, our hearts are vulnerable and they demand protection. You know, if you go to a meeting or go to a church and, and you discover that your pastor or somebody, a Christian that you admired, was a thief or a murderer, an adulterer, or a fornicator or whatever, you probably would be outraged. And we would probably post things on social media, uh, do everything we could to remove them from ministry. But let's say that they were just something simple like rebellious, independent, contentious, proud, arrogant, angry. And they were like this most of the time. I think a lot of times we just dismiss that. We just kind of shrug it off saying, oh, you know, they're just human. They're just authentic. We like it because they're real, just like us. A heart that's proud, a heart that's arrogant, a heart that sows division. Listen, these things right here, these are issues of the heart that actually can bring us down to a place where we find ourselves influenced by something that's completely contrary to the mind of God. These things might seem like a big deal, but they're your responsibility. You didn't, listen, you didn't wait for God to show up and brush your teeth or get you dressed today. Those things are simple and they're daily, but they're your responsibility. I don't think any of you got up this morning and said, well, if God wants me to brush my teeth, then he'll brush them. Or if God wants me to shower, then suddenly the shower will just come on and that'll be God's way of saying, I want you to do it. That's not the way this thing works. We, we know that these small matters are our own responsibility and we consistently do them no matter whether we're tired or depressed or confused. Listen, you always put your clothes on before you leave the house no matter what your attitude is. And we've got to be just as responsible when it comes to dealing with attitudes of the heart. If we say, well, I don't have to be responsible for my actions and my attitudes today. I don't have to be humble. I don't have to be encouraging it's been a hard year, you say, Bill. 2020 has been kind of a pain. Well, listen, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, talks about putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And it means taking daily responsibility to deal with the issues of the heart, the attitudes of our own heart. You can't ignore these responsibilities just because you're a Christian or just because you feel like you're burnt out. Listen, the only time you're burnt out is when you're the fuel, which is rooted in pride. Ultimately, you and I have been given the responsibility to actually care for the issues of our own heart. If you tolerate bitterness or offense over months or years, even if it feels justified, you're providing a, a playground for the works of darkness to actually plant seeds, take root, and bear fruit from your heart. I think most of the time we find ourselves in a place of bitterness when we don't see justice happening. And justice comes from a place of righteousness. But if we allow a root of bitterness to actually spring up in our lives, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15 says that we end up defiling a lot of people around us. Why? Because anger and critical, uh, a critical attitude or a critical spirit, when they go hand in hand, it's really hard to, to produce an environment around you that is conducive to the joy of the Lord. It's not strengthening to the, to the body of Christ around us. And even within the church, we've got to guard our heart against a root of bitterness birthed out of offense. 
Look, Jesus won the victory for us by shedding his blood on the cross and raising from the dead, defeating death and hell once and for all. But you and I won't experience that victory of Christ in our daily walk if we don't deal with the attitudes of our own heart. I'm coming to the end of the broadcast here, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 9 tells us how to actually walk out dealing with the attitudes of the heart, and humility is the only way forward. I'm not going to have time to probably deal with the most important one of all. The last battleground is the battleground of our mouth. I preached a lot about this in the past. You can go back in the archives and you can find the, all the sermons about how to declare victory, releasing authority from your mouth. But let me just give you one verse. James chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, from the same mouth proceed both blessing and cursing. And he says, you know, these things ought not to be. And you and I have the power to release a supernatural blessing from our mouth, or you can actually aid uh, the attack of darkness upon the lives of people. And listen, today, I want to encourage you as we come to the close of this, this podcast, listen, to let the battlegrounds of your mind, your heart, and your mouth be ruled by the kingdom of God. You and I are citizens of another world, another kingdom, but we are in this world for the purpose of enforcing the victory of Christ. The victory on the cross 2,000 years ago and that blood that's never lost its power over darkness. And so today, I encourage you, let the kingdom of God flood your heart, your mind, and your mouth with goodness and release it from within you to impact the world around you. Thank you, Lord, for this time today, God. I thank you for the opportunity to just speak truth into the atmosphere. Lord, I pray that it would touch every person's heart, mind, and mouth as we hear and respond to your word today. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who doesn't know you, that by faith right now they would say, Lord Jesus, I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving, for saving, for loving me. I am your child now and forever by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can send for this broadcast by writing to Faith Mountain Ministries, Box 595, Marshall, Minnesota, 56258. The address again, Faith Mountain Ministries, Box 595, Marshall, Minnesota, 56258. Jump online and listen to the broadcast anytime at VanderbushMinistries.com or BillVanderbush.com. And we thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today just an honor to do this every single week. This is Bill Vanderbush from all of us here at Faith Mountain Ministries. Until next time, may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.